Last season, Kawhi Leonard hit one of the most clutch shots in recent playoff history. A buzzer beater to send the 76ers home after a nail-biting seven-game series. Kawhi spent the next month stepping up in some of the biggest moments of his career on the biggest stage, earning him the title as one of the most clutch shooters in the league. Only, the idea of being clutch is a myth. Specifically, clutch shooting does not exist. I know, I know. It sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it's true. There is virtually no correlation between being clutch and playing great in big moments. Because when you look at the numbers, regardless of if a player is known as being clutch or not, it really has no effect on the end result. For example, take Michael Jordan, regarded as arguably the most clutch player of all time, and take DeMar DeRozan, a player that is known for his lackluster performances in late game playoff situations. For his career, Michael Jordan shot 46% from the field in clutch moments. In this case, clutch being defined as the last 12 minutes of game time when the score is separated by six points or less. This specific time in the game is defined as clutch moments because production and efficiency in these moments swing the win probability considerably more than any other moments in the game. Some fans may define clutch as something different, but for this situation, this is the definition we are working with. In these same circumstances, DeRozan shoots 44%. Hardly any difference at all. So it must be in the playoffs where Jordan separates himself as a clutch player, right? Wrong. Even in the playoffs, MJ has very similar clutch shooting numbers as DeRozan does. Another player who was regarded as a clutch assassin was Kobe Bryant. Compare him to a player like LeBron who is infamously known to choke in clutch moments and again you'll find that the numbers do not match the narrative. In fact, the numbers tell a completely different story. For his career, Kobe shot 44.4% from the field in clutch moments, whereas LeBron has shot 51.6% from the field in those same moments. Some may argue that Kobe has simply taken more of these clutch shots, so he is prone to have a lower percentage, which is wrong. Go through the list of players that fans think are clutch and players that fans think are choke artists, and there is almost no correlation between supposed clutch shooters and the actual result. Of course, there are players who shoot well in big moments, but the reason has nothing to do with being clutch. The only correlation here is the relationship between a player's shooting percentage in normal game time versus their shooting percentage in clutch moments. Players that tend to shoot more efficiently during regular game time tend to shoot respectively more efficiently in clutch game time. In other words, the players who come up big in clutch moments are the same players who come up big in normal moments. Any other conclusion is false and based in some sort of bias. Simply put, clutch game time makes virtually every player shoot a little bit worse at the same rate. But the list of NBA myths that have been embedded into basketball history is long and filled with claims that oftentimes make absolutely no sense at all. A myth, by definition, is an exaggerated or idealized conception of a person or thing. And there are a lot of myths regarding the NBA and its history. If someone says something enough times and enough people start to believe it, eventually that claim somehow becomes fact in the eyes of fans if it sticks around long enough. Like the idea of super teams and when they originated. If you ask the average NBA fan when they think Super Team started, they will more than likely refer to LeBron and the Heat in 2010. Others may say the Celtics in 2008 were the first Super Team. And this was the beginning of the end, the decision that threw the league's parity and competitiveness into the toilet. But the idea that Super Teams were formed for the first time just a decade ago is a myth. In reality, neither of these teams were the first to put together a packed roster full of stars and Hall of Famers. The formation of super teams in the NBA has a long and star-studded history.
As you can see, there have been many super teams throughout the history of the NBA. Since the league's inception, the idea of stacking the deck in your team's favor has always been a strategy to win championships. I mean, for crying out loud, it only took the Lakers two seasons to say, what's stopping us from getting four of the best players in the world on our team? The answer was nothing. Nothing was stopping them from having this advantage. And so that's exactly what they did. And they proceeded to win five championships in six seasons. But it was the Boston Celtics who really perfected the super team in the 60s by featuring a team with 11 Hall of Famers in an 11 year span, turning the NBA into their personal punching bag. Next it was the Lakers, then the Knicks, who by the way, are almost never mentioned among all time great teams, but had six Hall of Famers with four of them in their prime on the same team. And in more recent history, you have the Celtics, Lakers, and 76ers in the 80s, followed by the second three-peat Bulls in the late 90s. But notice how there is a gap between 1998 and 2008 where there were no super teams in the NBA. Every team that won a title throughout this 10-year stretch had a two-man show or was one cohesive unit with a single superstar. This 10-year gap is where I think the misconception originated. The long stretch of seasons that didn't feature a super team gave NBA fans the illusion that no such thing had ever even existed. That winning a title with a more traditional, non-star studded team was the only way to do it, or at least in most fans' opinion, the right way to do it. Then came the 2008 Celtics, which for some reason tends to get glossed over as the team that revived the super team. And then the nail in the coffin was the 2010 Miami Heat, which reminded GMs around the league that you can power pack a team. Since then, we have seen a couple super teams and just as many attempted super teams. But the fact remains that the Miami Heat did not ruin the NBA in 2010, and neither did the Celtics in 2008. Super teams with an unfair advantage of sheer talent have been around since the league began. And the whole purpose of a super team is to win championships. But one myth when it comes to obtaining titles is that defense wins championships. This is a phrase used across many different sports, including basketball. But the fact of the matter is that this isn't true. Well, kinda. Great defense is an important ingredient to any championship team. But great offense is just as important and the numbers back this up. In the last 20 NBA Finals, the team with the better defensive rating won the Finals 12 times and lost 8 times. In that same time span, the team with the better offensive rating won 12 times and lost 8 times as well. The better offensive team won the Finals just as often as the better defensive team. In fact, over the last 40 seasons, on average, the team that won the NBA championship had a defensive rating that ranked 5th among the league. During that same time span, the average offensive rating for these championship teams was ranked 5th among the league. In other words, offense is just as important as defense is in the NBA. So the reality is defense and offense wins championships. Wow, who would have thought? But as much as offense has evolved, defense has more or less stayed the same. The hardest player to defend in NBA history being the 7 foot 1 inch behemoth that averaged 50 points for an entire season, Wilt Chamberlain. And believe it or not, Wilt did not score all of his points on 6 foot 6 inch centers. It's a myth. This past season, the average NBA player was 6 foot 6 inches tall. Throughout the 60s, the average height of an NBA player was also 6 foot 6 inches tall. As a whole, height in the NBA has hardly fluctuated at all since the 60s. In fact, in the 1961-62 NBA season, the season will average 50 points per game, the average height of a center in the NBA was 6'10 and a half. The average height for a center in today's NBA is 6'10 and 9 tenths inches. Hardly any difference at all. Wilt was facing off against centers that were the same size as centers in today's NBA. Why fans believe that he played a bunch of average sized men is beyond me. Ever since the 60s, NBA players have always been tall. Wilt was just that dominant. But Wilt was so different for his time that it almost feels like his entire career was a myth. The things he did were so unbelievable that half of these feats literally sound made up. But one aspect of Wilt's mythical career was that at his peak, 
he had a 48 inch vert. You'll see this claim all over the internet like it's fact. But as magnificent of an athlete Wilt was, this is simply a myth. To give you an idea of what kind of numbers world class jumpers put up, here are the best max vertical leaps recorded in the last 20 NBA combines. Keep in mind these are max verts, not standing verts. Now, although Wilt's supposed vertical leap is 2 inches higher than any recorded NBA vert in the last 20 years, 48 inches doesn't look too unreasonable on this list. I mean, Wilt was a freak of nature. But here's where Wilt's 48 inch vert would rank him amongst the highest jumping centers of the last 20 years. Yeah with a claimed vertical leap nearly 8 inches higher than the next closest center of the last 20 years, this claim starts to look a bit suspicious. The highest official vertical leap ever recorded in the NBA came from DJ Steffens in 2013 when he put up a record-breaking 46-inch vert. You want to see what a 46-inch vertical leap looks like on a 6-foot 5-inch player? Dog. Look at this. Now DJ is 8 inches shorter than Wilt was and has a vert 2 inches lower than Wilt claimed his vert was. Do you know how ridiculous it would look if a 7 footer had a 48 inch vert? Well, like this. Here's what a 46 inch vert looks like on 6 foot 6 inch Gerald Green. LeBron has a vertical leap somewhere in the 40 to 44 inch range and we've seen him get up like this. Here's 6 foot 10 inch Blake Griffin's 37 inch vert, 6 foot 10 inch Aaron Gordon's 39 inch vert, and 6 foot 8 inch Larry Nance Jr.'s 38 inch vert. But no matter how much digging I do, from Wilt's college days to his later years in the NBA, I cannot find a single image or clip that displays a vertical leap higher than the ones we've looked at. Granted, looking at old grainy footage isn't the best source for calculating measurements, but you know what is? This image put together by a Reddit user who used pixel mapping to roughly measure Wilt's leaping ability. Here's another shot he used for reference. I mean, my man's was really crunching the numbers. His final calculations landed Wilt's vertical leap somewhere in the 38 to 40 inch range, which is much more plausible than the 48 inch figure we have often heard. In 2011, Dwight Howard, with a standing reach of 9 foot 3 inches and a max reach of 12 foot 6 inches, measured his vertical leap at 39 inches. Wilt's reach was 9 foot 7 inches, and video evidence shows that he could reach to the top of the backboard at 13 feet, which would give him a max vert of about 41 inches. In fact, every piece of half ass evidence I could conjure up suggests his peak vert was probably around 40 inches. Now this may not sound all too crazy, until you consider the fact that, and this may blow your mind, but in the history of the NBA, Miles Plumlee is the only player taller than 6 foot 8 inches to officially record a vertical leap higher than 40 inches. Sounds like I just made that shit up, but it's true. Did Wilt have a record 48 inch vert? It is very unlikely. And somehow, for a 7 footer born 84 years ago, Wilt's 40 inch vert is probably the least shocking thing about his fascinating and dominating career. Let me know in the comments what are some NBA myths that you know? How and why do you think these myths originate? Share your thoughts, subscribe to the channel if you have not already, and as always, until next time.